Welcome, everyone. What you're about to hear right now is a look at the world we ought to be living in, a world of abundance, a world of love. And there is one person right here, right now, that I feel is probably the most credentialed to cover this topic in the world right now on this planet. Um, well, I'll take that back. There's no competition here, but the overwhelming amount of love and respect and, you know, I, I can't really introduce this guy because he's just so cool. And when I was trying to figure out what was going on, he provided me some reassurance that I'm not alone. And we, we have people from all areas of, you know, all different walks of life looking at this stuff. And here I was, some 20-year-old whippersnapper, and I have this 92-year-old friend here, and we're having the same conversation from completely different backgrounds, from complete, it's just amazing, okay? So without further ado, I would like for you to welcome Dr. Hart Stringfeld for the first time ever speaking about what he's been researching his entire life, what he is passionate about, and this is just gonna be absolutely amazing. Dr. Hart Stringfeld, ladies and gentlemen. you to know right off the bat is that I love you. <laughs> I've been waiting all my life for an audience like this. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> when uh, Bob asked me to talk, I was uh, stunned because I haven't spoken to anybody like you in my whole life. And uh, the opportunity to talk to you <clears throat> is a very great honor to me. Uh, you know, by your presence here, you tell me that you're enlightened in many ways and that you are, how shall I say it, the future leaders of the our country. It's not your time yet because we have the Illuminati and the, the, the cabal that's still hanging on. But I want you to know that they're in full retreat, they're in panic. They know that the war has been lost to them. And they're just running, hiding in the nearest hole they can find. They're building uh, cities under the ground. They're buying land over in New Zealand and other places and building their enclaves over there thinking that they'll be protected. But we know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I've learned, you know. I've been around the block a few more times than you have and picked up some information and some ideas that might be of interest to you, and that's what I want to talk about, things I've learned. I want to say that everything that I tell you is, to the best of my knowledge, absolutely true, and although my sources <clears throat> might be questionable, in my heart, I've been taking the information I've had, and I'm basing on, not just on the facts that I know, but on things that my heart says, this has got to be true. So that's, that's a caveat that I start with. Uh, to start out with a little bit about me for just a few seconds. I was born in a small town in Gainesville, Florida. 1924, which World War I was just over. Uh, it was so small that was, if you saw somebody in town that you, knew, that you didn't know, you knew that the train was in town. <laughs> and incidentally, the train went down Main Street on the track right down the middle of the freaking street. It stopped off at the White House Hotel. Everybody got off to have lunch because there was no, uh, no place to get it on the car, on the train. Then they get back on the train and take off again. Really strictly fall, small town stuff. I was raised by a very devout mother, so I was very much involved in the Episcopal Church, choir boy, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scout, all that stuff. And so I was learned to be very idealistic. And this was a characteristic of my life, all through my life, always looking for the utopia that never existed. Well, <clears throat> War more came along, World War I came along, two came along, and of course, every able-bodied man went to war. I ended up, because my father was an engineer, I became a combat engineer, 
and uh, was headed for the jungles of uh, in, in Southeast Asia, fighting the Japanese in the jungles. When I got an amazing thing happened, I had one an appointment to Annapolis. So I went there, and instead of going to Guadalcanal, I went to Annapolis. Thank God that saved my life. I graduated because I was blind. They put me in the supply corps. And I uh, ended up in 1951 in Mare Island, California, where the uh, Navy had, had at that time a submarine repair facility. And uh, I was, because I was supply corps, I was in charge of all the resale activities in the place. Uh, you know, two, two Navy exchanges, uh, laundry, gasoline station, the whole works. It was a big job for a little kid that's 25 years old and uh, didn't know what he was doing. Uh, I found a group of engineers there, and this changed my life. Because I was, <clears throat> had a degree in engineering at that time, I liked the, the things the way they thought. Uh, it was just a refreshing change from everybody else in the area. And uh, it's good that they had an interest in macroeconomics. They were going to change the nature of our social system and our economic system. And they had carefully designed this way of doing things that I thought was a little pinko. So I said to the guys, I said, uh, yes, this is interesting, but I'm going to report you to the FBI. <laughs> and they said, fine, go ahead and try it and see what happens. So I called up the FBI and told them that I thought we had some possible communists in them, among us. But this was in the area of Senator Joseph McCarthy it was just around the corner. He was breathing down everybody's neck and I wanted to make sure that this was okay. So the FBI laughs and says, oh yeah, they're, they're very fine patriots, but a little cuckoo, but uh, uh, no, no problem there. So the more I got into it, the more I found that this was something I really wanted to know about. Then there was a, uh, <clears throat> a gentleman on the campus on the, uh, <clears throat> on the, in the facility who was an industrial psychologist, and we got to be good friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, he was talking about things, you know, utopias always bug, go bust because there's somebody in there that cheats on the system and they, uh, it, then it falls apart. So it's the human nature, which never changes, and human behavior, which can be adapted to the ambient environment, was the problem. And he said, look, Art, if you go to gap legs, you can understand the problem. Gap legs, that's greed, anger, pride, that's gap, lust, envy, sloth, yeah, gluttony and sloth, that's legs. So he says, you look, look that down, and look at the fact that we are living in a scarcity economy. The temptation to be involved in those weaknesses, <clears throat> for most of us, is overwhelming at one time or another. And so basically, if you have a scarcity system, which we do, you're going to have a lot of temptation. On the other hand, if you have an abundant situation, which is what I'm really supposed to be talking about, all of these incentives fade away. Instead of greed, you have generosity. Instead of anger, you have kindness. Instead of pride, <clears throat> you have a more healthy attitude, and so on. So the point is, if we were to change the system, from greed, from scarcity to abundance, you also change the nature of the way we think. And because that's, we're more inclined to have a successful system. So that's one of the things that people just forget about. Well, <clears throat> let me, uh, I like the way the engineers went about this. They said, the first thing we gotta do is identify the problem. In this case, <clears throat> It seems that we have a physical problem, so maybe the answer is a physical solution. And not to get all the religion and the psychology and stuff out of the picture, let's just take a look at the, what we've got going for us and what the problem is. So they made a national, international survey, the United States and Canada as a continental whole. They analyzed that they had enough installed horsepower and natural resources 
to any kind of system you wanted to from, a stand, from a, an engineering standpoint, it would work if you could just get people to accept it, which of course that's the main problem. Uh, there were people involved in this were very famous people at the time. We're starting to talk about 1915. You've heard of Charles Steinmetz, the founder of General Electric, <clears throat> the electrical wizard. Well, he was uh, one of the initial people. Thorsten Veblen, who wrote the book, The Theory of the Leisure Class, and other books, he was involved. You heard of Stuart Chase. I'm just naming people that you know, even though they might uh, be uh, several people that were just as smart, but not as famous. Uh, Howard uh, Scott was the chief engineer of U.S. Steel, and he was really the boss, was the intellectual genius that put them all together. And then the most famous one of all was called Dr. M. King Hubbard, who was a world-famous geologist, uh, so famous that uh, they named one of the graphs that they used called Hubbard's Peak. That was an analysis of the geological locations for oil in the ground. And he gave a show that if you go along in the history of people, all of a sudden there's a, whoop, a little blip on there. And that was the of arrival of knowledge about oil and gas in the ground, and then the departure to finish of it. In other words, in those days, we didn't think of oil as abiotic. It was something that was there to start with and would be used up. Today, we're not too sure. So those are the people involved. Now, one of the things they did after they made the survey was to <coughs> make a prediction. And this was, I thought, was very cocky of them. They said, this was in January 1920, they said, <clears throat> based on our analysis, if we are right, the whole caboodle is going to break apart, the price system we call it, the economic system, is going to fall apart by January the 1st, 1930. And guess what? On the 29th of October, 1929, the stock market crashed, the bankers started jumping out of the windows, the whole world collapsed into a worldwide depression, and they just missed it by a couple of months. So they were pretty good predictors. Uh, this is some of the elements of the system. Uh, they were going to balance the load. They were going to produce more than enough and make sure that people had enough money or something. They didn't use money, they used something called energy certificate. The reason for that is because Money varies from day to day in terms of its value. You know, the best, the best definition of the word value is a measure of the force of desire. Well, you, you can't base a whole economic system based on an estimate of what the, the value of money might be from one day to the next. So they chose energy, man hours, man hours, kilowatt hours, kilogram calories, and things like that. So it, it, it was, they would never change. You could always measure that exactly. Anyway, <clears throat> they said for the education, let's give everybody a free education for their lifetime. Well, from zip birth to the age of 25, give the free to no, no commitments to the system except to learn. From the age of, from 25 to 45, that 20 years, we'll ask you to donate 16 hours a week with 78 day pay paid vacation. At the age of 45, you're free for life to do as you please. Particularly, we encourage education, research, things like that. <clears throat> uh, with regard to health, all health is free. And more than, more than importantly, it would be preventive health, <coughs> getting people before they get sick, making sure that the nutrition is there. And we will have a healthy or, or a healthy uh, population. As far as politics go, there wouldn't be any. Politicians and people, and if they're not stirring up trouble, they're trying to find a way to spend your money. And uh, we're not going to have any money, so we really don't need politicians. We will have a few lawyers because there'll be a few laws involved. And furthermore, those laws will be common law and not admiralty law. I'm sure you know the difference. As far as crime, we're not going to have any. 
95% of all crime is economic based. So if we don't have any economic problems, we shouldn't have any crime. But we will have personality problems. And people born with uh, PTSD or something like that. So we'll have hospitals where people can go and get treated. Uh, as far as the police and military, <clears throat> we'll always have military to defend ourselves as long as there's somebody to defend ourselves against. But as the world turns into peace, our military will disappear. And police, they'll be more like uh, these policemen that are trying to show people that they love them and that they're there to help. The economic uh, situation is going to be organized so that for any particular uh, activity like uh, transportation, communications, health, uh, energy, all these things will be in a vertical sequence. So everybody will be that's, uh, involved with, say, communications will work for a single sequence. And within that sequence, in terms of elections and that sort of thing, you'll have people electing people within your little group that you know personally that they can step up. There will be recommendations from both those to who they think you should be promoted and acceptance from above. They'll pick the one that, out of the two or three that was uh, involved from the bottom. <coughs> they will pick that. So it's what little elections of democracy that you have will be on a sequence basis. And then at the very top, where you have all of these leaders of sequences, there will be a selection for a group would be this general, general control of problems that would be of an international nature. Uh, as far as private ownership, uh, why do you have private ownership? If you have it, uh, it for which you live, the thing you use, that is yours forever until you leave it. And then when you leave it, you don't have any use for it unless you want to make money or just reserve it as an exclusive use in the future, in which case, what you do in this situation is you would <clears throat> have private ownership for anything that you use, and for other things, you would be available. When you need it, you can ask for it and get it. For example, automobiles, you wouldn't need an automobile. You pick up the phone, say, I need a, a car uh, at my doorstep to be delivered, and you walk downstairs, and from a central garage where all the cars are stored, it would have a vehicle for your, with, you, with your name on it, really. And you'd use it as long as you want, and then you turn it back in. You don't have to put gas in it. You don't have to maintain it, anything like that. That's the general idea about it. So there's be a conservation of all resources. There'll be a lot of recycling and high-quality high quality products. For example, why should you buy, um, build a cheap car when you spend exactly the same amount of energy and use some t same materials to buy a, a, a very expensive car. There will, be, there will be no more shoddy production. And the production would be based on quality. You get instead of a tire that blows out at 50,000 miles, why not 200,000 miles in the car? You can make it. We simply don't design it because we couldn't stay in business that way in, in, the, in the current system. Uh, in terms of energy, and this what I want to de <clears throat> digress just a little bit about energy. Anybody ever heard of a gentleman named Dr. M. T. Keshe, K. E. S. H. E. He is a uranium, an Iranian uranium engineer. He's got a factory in Brussels, in Belgium. Uh, he told me that. Uh, the Iranians, whom you know, are at least 50 years ahead of us technology, but we don't know it. It's, it's something that's been kept secret. But he has invented something called free energy. He's found a way to access the energy that's in the ambient, the, the uh, air above us, the magnetic core around the Earth, and he has invented a little energy called a plasma energy machine. It's about eight inches in diameter, about uh, 10 inches high. You stick it in your car, and you never buy any gas for the rest of your life. 
You put it in the, in the garage at the house, and you're off the grid. You don't pay any utilities fees. And you can make it, this, they're making right now, it's in manufacturing today in a factory in Manila that uh, they, Italy just ordered one million units of it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be spread well worldwide just as soon as we get the uh, uh, Mr. Rupert Murdoch to loosen up and print, print information about it. So this is just around the corner, folks. Uh, you can get uh, go to MT Cash on, your, on your, read about him on uh, Google, and he has a program on mtcash.com, I believe where you can see him demonstrating and trying to teach you about the technology that uh, is involved in this. It, uh, it is a, what they call an open source uh, information. In, 19, no, in 2012, Dr. Cash sent blueprints of how to make this to every major country in the world and said, this is a free gift to you do with it as you please. And every damn one of them put it in a safe, locked it, and it disappeared. Nobody, there was no publicity, and apparently no, no production, no use of it made. So one day he was uh, making a speech down in Mexico City, this is about two years ago, and he had a stopover in Toronto. The, the Canadian CIA, came and got him off the airplane, imprisoned him for 11 days, made photographs of all his books and things he brought, put him back on the plane, let him go. This is the kind of treatment you get when you're world famous and you threat to the Illuminati. Uh, that told him a lesson, so this time he didn't, uh, there was a, a thing, it was last year, they had a meeting over in, uh, I think it was in Brussels, where the world was given an opportunity to see him teach it. And he, I saw it on TV. He's just a little funny little teddy bear kind of a guy, very friendly, inoffensive, and if you can understand what he's saying, you're a better man than I am. <laughs> so this is all one of the things that's going on right now. One other thing I want about, about energy I want to point out is that there's something called thorium. It's a... Uh, it's a fissional material, kind of like U-235, uranium, but it's four, we got four times much of it we've known for the, that would last us for 10,000 years, and it has no threatening residue. It's far more adaptable than what we need. There's no threat for something like a Chernobyl or a Fukushima. And uh, the reason we don't use it is because it doesn't lead us to a weapon. Because uranium-235 will generate something that blows up and kills people, the, the Illuminati said, we'll go for that one because we want that weapon. And that's why we're having terrible job, terrible accidents like Fukushima. And incidentally, as in every damn uh, <clears throat> nuclear activity we got in America is leaking. They're all about to blow, and if we don't do something about it soon, we're going to have another Fukushima. And it could, this time it could be in America. So we, got, we need to do something. This is a critical time in the history where we've got to get up on our hind legs and holler, we are mad as hell and we ain't going to take it anymore. So, one of the questions that uh, comes up from time to time when I talk about this is people say, well, if you're going to give me an unlimited income, why in the hell would I have to go to work? I'm not going to go to work. I'm just going to let you take my income and sit on my heels. And the answer always is, you're thinking with a scarcity brain about a situation where you have an abundance and you can't make that transition unless you ch change the way you think. So what we're talking about right now is 
how you must go from the scarcity thinking machine to one that adapts you to living in an abundance. And this is something we're all going to have to go through if you haven't already made it. Now, <clears throat> I haven't named this organization yet. The reason I haven't read, told you yet is because for the last 75 years, the name of the organization has been anathema to the Illuminati. And they've done everything they can to hide it from you. In my considered opinion, as an engineer and, and, a, and also a humanitarian, this word, the word is technocracy, is a magic word that will transform America. But it's been hidden. One of the things that happened was the Catholic Church tried to buy the system out. Uh, the chief of the organization, his name was Howard Scott, told me in confidence, and he was like a father to me. I knew him, information that nobody in the North that's still alive probably knows except me. And he said, you know, Hart, he said, not only did the Catholic Church try to buy me, but he said there's a fellow named William Randolph Hearst. You probably heard of him. At that time, he was, had a whole chain of newspapers. And he said, Hart, I've got a copy of a telegram that he sent to all of his newspapers. And it said, quote, you will print nothing either for or against the subject of technocracy forever. And that's that ban still goes today, and it's to protect him from you. This is your celebration, in my birth, humble opinion, and the a lot of Illuminati are doing their very best to keep it up. If you've heard the system of the word at all, you've heard it in a pejorative context. So. <clears throat> now, I've got some good news for you. You're not going to believe this, because I sure had, I had trouble believing it myself. But about three or four months ago, I was listening to a British broadcast, TV broadcast, and a young Oriental man, about 40 years old, got on there and he said, I am representing the White Dragon Society. That's a group of ancient royal Oriental families that from time immemorial has secretly been combined, getting together and saving up all the treasure. Each time one was in ascendancy in the empire, they would save the money and hide it in caves in the Philippine Islands. And in some cases, they would sink ships, load the ship down with gold, and sink it in a secret place. Nobody would ever think to hide that. But the, uh, over the years, they accumulated an enormous treasury. One of the estimates was, and I can't, I can't even pronounce it, one times 10 to the 40th power. That's one followed by 40 zeros, dollars. Tetragillion, tetragazillion dollars is the best I can come up with. But this is an estimate of how much money they're talking about. So this young man, said to the audience listening, I have been designated as the representative of the White Dragon Society, and I'm telling you that we have decided to give this treasure to humanity and abolish poverty in the world in one fell swoop. He says, we're in the process now of transferring that gold to a new set of central banks and giving everyone in the world, including every one of you, a bank account, a new bank account, with maybe a lot of money, they probably a million dollars a piece. They've got that much money. You start to think, he says, my God, it can't be true. And if it were true, what is it going to do to society? All of a sudden, we're not thinking in scarcity anymore. We're thinking in abundance. One of the things they're going to recommend, I think, is that don't touch the money, just, let, just live on the interest. Let the money be there. Well, I'm sure the world is not going to be able to satisfy and produce all the information, all the material that you can buy with this new money anyway, so you might as well just take it easy and live on the income for a while. 
But this, this reality is supposed to be already delivered to you. But in about, about the 25th of February of this year, General Joe Dunford, you know who he is, he's a chief, he's a four-star Marine general who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in this country. And he was in a caravan, a series of cars. The caravan stopped suddenly on the road. He got out of his car and went to the car behind him. And just as he did so, the car he was in exploded and killed everybody in it. He apparently had gotten a message on the iPhone or something that get out of the car quick because they're going to execute you. Later on that same day, they had a sniper that shot at him and missed. So they got the shots. So there was, uh, the only information I have is that there was a, a frantic e an email given uh, on, the, on the public address system that said, General Joe Dunford escaped assassination, and we don't know much more than that, but we'll, we're not, we're closing down the system. There will be no more information given. That's gold, and the Jackman Bank accounts are sitting there waiting for somebody to announce it. But it's yours. It could happen tomorrow. I can, every day when I get up in the morning, first thing I do is check the news and see if it's exploded. <laughs> it's, I mean, this is real stuff. And yet it's hard to believe. You can, you can see my lips moving and saying this stuff. But you said, can that be true? Well, as far as I know, it is. And it can happen at any time. So uh, that's enough about that. Uh, Things are happening in the world now that uh, you just can't hardly believe. Uh, I wanted to mention the fact, tell you a little bit about the Illuminati, the people that own the world. Uh, I think if people are that evil, that rotten, it needs to be advertised. And you should know the names of the people, in particular the 13, 13 families that behind the scenes own the world, and because they exercise that power, they own you. If you don't know it already, you are slaves. You've been slaves since you were born, and you will be slaves until you wake up and decide you're mad as hell and you're not going to take it anymore. And that's one of the things, one of the things about you I see. Those 13 families are Astors, A-S-T-O-R, Bundy, I don't know anybody named Bundy, Collins, that's the common name, but a family of them. DuPont, you know about them. Freeman, Kennedy, we know all the Kennedys, it's a little too much about them, we don't need more. <laughs> the word L. I. Lee, that's an oriental name. Onassis, we all know about Jackie and Aristotle Onassis and that stuff. The Reynolds, is that the R.J. Reynolds family? I don't know. <coughs> Rockefeller, we know about those bastards. <laughs> Rothschild. The original name was Meyer Bayer, a little Japanese uh, moneylender in, in uh, England. Who, when he got rich, he decided to change his name, and he looked up and said, well, I've got this red shield over on the front door of my house, so I'll change the name Red Shield to Rothschild, Rothschild. So that's where the Rothschild name came from. And they really have... Uh, done some bad things. Uh, the Russells and the Van Duns, that's D-U-Y-N. In addition to the families, other places you're going to find these uh, Illuminati, these rat, rats, is in the Trilateral Commission, the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, that's named after a hotel they was first started meeting in 12 years ago. <coughs> The MJ-12, wow, have you heard about that? Bad stuff. General Eisenhower, when the, apparently, and I don't know, about 15 years ago, I don't remember, uh, <clears throat> they were making tunneling and ran into a tunnel that led into an underground city owned and operated by a, an alien race called the Greys. And uh, they, uh, instead of fighting each other, and they decided to talk about it. 
And General Eisenhower appointed a committee of 12 people, oh, the majestic 12, to negotiate a treaty with these so-called greys to give them a place to live in America, in the, in the world, underground, in exchange for very valuable technological information that would make us uh, the superpower in the world, such as uh, how to build a spaceship, how to run it on speeds in excess of the speed of light, free energy, anti-magnetism, and other things. These are all, um, he got them and put them immediately, gave them to the Air Force so that we could have ascendancy in the skies. <clears throat> in the meantime, they also negotiated 25,000 children a year to be eaten or to be used as slaves by the graves. Where they got those 25,000 kids and what they've done with them, we don't know. But it is a disgrace and a dishonor for people involved. It's a, so there's some interconnected families. The Disney family, you know them. The Krupp family, that's the industrialists in Europe. And the McDonald family. The New World Order, the uh, neocons, the Zionists, they call them. It's partly Nazi and part Zionist. And uh, there was one last one, the Merovingians, which is the European royalty. So this is just some, not all, of the people that are making your life miserable and enslaving you. Now, another wonderful topic. The word NISARA, National Economic Security and Reformation Act. And I'm going to read you a paragraph. I don't like reading, but just one quick paragraph to, to give you a background. In late one evening on March the 9th, 2000, a written quorum call was hand delivered by the Delta Force and Navy SEALs to 15 members of the Senate and the House who were sponsors and co-sponsors of this, comp this word, uh, word Nisara. It was a bill that was written and then passed by authorized members of Congress and passed by Bill Clinton, and I think it was at the point of a gun, but he just signed it. And so it is a legitimate law on the books in existing today, and it's been on the books since the year 2000, that's 16 years ago. But it has never been officially announced because when it is announced, it will be the death of the Illuminati. I'm going to tell you about it a little bit right now. These people were immediately escorted by the Delta Force and the Navy SEALs through their respective voting chambers where they passed this act. These 15 members of Congress, 15, not the whole Congress, they, this, these 15 members were the only people lawfully allowed to hold office in accordance with the original 13th Amendment. Remember, British soldiers destroyed copies of the Titles of Nobility Amendment in the War of 1812 because it prevented anyone who had ties to the Crown of England from holding public office. Nisara is the most groundbreaking reformation to sweep not only this country, but our planet in the history of the the act does away with the Federal Reserve Bank, the IRS, the shadow government, you know we have two governments, one secret, and much more. Uh, there's a lot of background information, fascinating reading, but it's far too much information I can't give you today. I recommend you look into it. I'm going to give you a reference for it. Now, this is the things that Nassara does. Number one, it zeroes all your credit card payments. No mortgages and any bank, bank debt due to illegal banking and government activities. This is the Federal Reserve's worst nightmare. It's a jubilee or forgiveness of debt. And it happens, when it happens, your car payments, your mortgage, and any debt that you, any debt that you have within limits is going to simply going to be, disappear. It abolishes the income tax and abolishes the IRS too. The employees of the IRS are going to transfer over to the Treasury Department. It creates a 14% flat rate for taxation. And this time, your tax money will go to 
support the income, um, support the country. Did you know that every penny of your income tax goes directly to the, it doesn't pass go and collect $200, it goes directly to the City of London, which is a consortium of international banks over in England, in London, where they take this trillions of dollars and take their cut and then send the rest to the Vatican. The Vatican owns America. We'll go into that tonight. Uh, if you have a house and you want to sell it, no tax because it's not a new, new item. Food and gasoline and things like that, medicine, will not be taxed. It increases benefits to senior citizens. Incidentally, is anybody here that's older than 90 years old? <laughs> Well, I guess I'm the oldest one here. <laughs> it returns constitutional law, gets rid of admiralty law. It reinstates the original title of the nobility amendment, which says if you've been awarded some kind of title from England, you can lose your citizenship. It establishes a new presidential and congressional elections immediately for three months, 120 days. That means that somebody sitting on ready right now in some place in America that has been designated to replace Obama and everybody in Congress and a lot of other positions of authority, as soon as this thing is declared, whammo. All we need is somebody in authority to declare it and say, this law is now established. It's been passed, but until it's, until it's passed by and announced by somebody in authority, we can't make it work. That's frustrating. <clears throat> anyway, the interim government will cancel all national emergencies and return us back to constitutional law. This law creates a new treasury rainbow currency backed by gold, silver, and platinum. That's the only, and if you read the Constitution, that's the only money there is. This uh, piece of paper that you get in your pocket that you call money, it's not money, it's a death certificate. Monetized debt. It's worthless, but because we've been suckered into thinking that it's worth it has value, and if somebody will, that another sucker will take it as money, we thought we call it money. Actually, money is, oh, well, I won't go into that. <clears throat> uh, this, this law in, initiates a new treasury bank system in alignment with the constitutional law. It eliminates the Federal Reserve System, which incidentally is not federal and has no reserves. <laughs> it's a scam, folks. I've been screwed one more time. But anyway, we're going, to we're going to restore financial privacy for a change. It retains all judges, oh, sorry, retrains all judges and attorneys in constitutional law. I love that because I know for a fact that particularly if it's a judge in the IRS system, he's a crook. I have a friend of mine who was successfully defending people from having to pay their income tax, and they, they, because it's never been ratified, and there was no law in the books requiring that you pay income tax. You know that, don't you? Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts is quoted, and I have the reference, saying, as far as I know, there's no law requiring you to pay income tax. But you know, if it's like the, uh, we've, we've got the mafia in Italy, we've got an American mafia, it's called the IRS, and instead of breaking your legs, they just take, all, take everything you got, put you in jail, without any law to, to substantiate it, except that they'll just do it and get away with it. And the money then, of course, goes to Europe instead of to the, support our country. So, but we're going to retrain these judges, put them back to school, and teach them more about common law and not about adversary law. It ceases all aggressive U.S. government military actions worldwide. You know we've got over 700 outposts, military outposts, that are supported in countries that really, I don't think they, we, they really want us, but because we are giving them money, we're giving them your money to it might say, just pay our way over there. 
uh, we, we're going to bring all those people home. Establishes peace, in the, peace around the world, releases enormous sums of money for humanitarian purposes, and enables the release of over 6,000 patents, including things like uh, anti-gravity, free energy, and one that I really like, sonic healing machine. You get in this little box, close the door, and turn on the switch, and when you come back out, you're healed. Uh, all kinds of stuff that's been denied from us by our own, country, by our own government <laughs> for, for the benefit of the Illuminati, because they want to keep us sick. You know, we have a medical mafia in the country in addition to the, the other one. So this is basically what we... Uh, I wanted to give you also a reference. If you're looking for... There's so much that I recommend you read about this entire president. And there's a, an HTTPS address that you might want to do. It'll, you can give it to you later if you want it. Pathwaytoascension.wordpress.com slash 2011-08-17. That's the date of the history of Sneezera. And uh, if you want to check with me later, I've got it here. So there's good things are happening. We have the uh, possibility of technocracy in the future. And I want to say this about technocracy. It is so far out from where we are that uh, even Howard Scott in 1950 when I met him, that uh, he, he admitted himself, he says, the change is going to be so dramatic, I don't really know how we're going to get from here to, to there. Well, all of a sudden, if we got the prosperity fund, it's just going to be dropped in our lap. That's a big step in the right direction. And I see that as an interim necessary first step before we get to technocracy. So we've always needed a guide, something like a utopian objective. To, in our dreams, this is, this is where we need to go. In other words, it's not just a matter of chicken in every pot and car in every garage and uh, maybe an increase in salary from time to time under the with influence of the Illuminati. But it's ejecting all of that and starting all over again with a society that has unlimited income and lack of concern for all of these scarcity things like public ownership and worrying about your salary, insecurity. It's going to be a whole new world, folks, and it's right around the corner. That's my message today. That's, that's what it's all about. Finally, one of the things that I was asked to talk about is love. What a wonderful thing. When I was in the Navy, I was just a nice little guy. And, uh, <laughs> those bastards, uh, they changed me. The Navy, it's like the old German in World War I, he says, why is there so many more horses asses than there is horses? Well, the Navy sure had their share of them, and I always seemed to get one that uh, beat up on me. And I learned in particular one destroyer I was working on. Uh, the executive officer made it a point to t torment me, and I learned to hate him. I can, I'm embarrassed to say that, that I really hate the thought of it, but I wanted I had dreams at night about how I could throw him over the side and get away with it. <laughs> well, thank God I didn't do it, but I really wanted to. But uh, <clears throat> I found myself depressed about it every time I thought about it. It was like I weight around my neck. And one day I said, what the hell am I doing? I'm hurting myself by hating him. He's the bad guy, and I'm hurting myself. I'm going to make a positive decision that I will forgive him and not ever think about him in a bad light again. I made that decision. It was like it just said, I will do it. And the enormous weight off my back, I felt like I was freed, just like I just got out of jail. 
it was an awake, it was a, just an awakening to me about what it happens when you decide that you're just not going to submit to all these cap legs type activities and become a lover of white life. Uh, I'm sort of embarrassed to tell you, but I went out in my yard one day and I said, I've never hugged a tree. I wonder what it's like. <laughs> so I went over this tree uh, and reached down and hugged that tree. And it was a mystical experience. I had no idea. So when I see my flowers, I tell them I love them. I love my trees. I sit in the backyard and I say, this is my world. You know, I have a backyard that you can't describe in any way except it's an organized jungle. <laughs> in fact, uh, when, I was in the, when I was at dental college as a professor, one of the things I did was to take all the light, lights out and put them in grow lights. And then I would weave vines all around the ceiling and hanging baskets. You go up to my office, you couldn't see me. You had to go in and around the baskets. I had a fish tank with a, had a bunch of uh, you know, oriental fish. And one of the uh, dental uh, officers had a son who took to me and he brought me some tadpoles one day. And so I would feed the tadpoles. And uh, I didn't realize it, but they were getting going legs and <laughs> little tiny baby frogs. And one day I came to work and everybody was standing out in the hall watching what was going on. And there was a bunch of little baby frogs walking down the hall. <laughs> they had slipped in under the door. Anyway, the point is, they called me Jaime Hungla, which means Jungle Jim in Spanish. So uh, I've just been a nature boy. You know, I wear clothes, but I'm really a nature boy. <laughs> but I, some years ago, in my quest for love, I had an epiphany. I just woke up one day and I said, there's different kinds of love. There's filial love, there's brotherly love, there's spiritual love, there's erotic love, all these different kinds of loves. But I'm not satisfied. I want the ultimate kind of love that there is, it's called unconditional love. Yeah. I love people. I love every living thing, all my animals I love. But I had a special love for African American ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I. I'm, I'm telling stuff you know, I, would, I don't think I've ever told this before. <laughs> but I, I found a group of little old ladies that were, or they were collecting money for, to give to high school students for doing a good job, kind of kickstart for college. And I asked them if I'd like, I'd like to join with them. So it's uh, 25 years of elderly little black ladies and me. <laughs> and I never had so much love in my whole life. It just, uh, just something I really cherish. So uh, there's good things to happen if you just make that decision. I'm going to be a source of unconditional love. And then one day I found out that uh, unconditional love is a way of getting to heaven. Uh, most people meditate. And I tried it, a, not a dozen, but a hundred times. And my active mind just wouldn't let me do it. So I said, to hell with it. I'll just go with initial Live and see what happens. <laughs> well, somebody, t t I forget who it was, said, Art, if you can do it really sincerely and practice unconditional love, you will automatically qualify for the fourth dimension. Well, the fourth dimension is some kind of a holding dimension before you go into the fifth, which is nirvana, heaven. And I said, that's great. So I've been counting on that. And then about, uh, about two weeks ago, I think, there's an ascended being called Quan Yin. Is that somebody you know? OK, Quan Yin came on TV. He's a beautiful young man. Smiling, I, I don't know how anybody can smile 24 hours a day, but he does. <laughs> but he said that this is breaking news, folks. 
I have information from heaven that the fourth dimension is crumbling and it's going to disappear. And it's already happened. I guess there's no more fourth dimension. Well, you win some and you lose some. I was, <laughs> I thought I was in the fourth dimension, but it looked like I had to start all over. <laughs> uh, I really would like to learn how to meditate, but I don't know how to do it. In fact, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. But. Uh, that's it. That's kind of where I am. It's, I've got some heroes. One of those heroes was sitting out here yesterday, and I don't know if you know it or not, but he's one of the great heroes of my life. His name is Kevin Annette. Kevin is a, he was a, formerly a, an Episcopal Canadian priest, and he found out that the Catholic Church had been taking children from the Northwest Indian complex out in Northwest Canada. They'd run them into, involuntarily into these Catholic schools, and from there they would disappear. They, they, was, they were being groomed for rape, torture, and death in these horrible places, one of which was in the Vatican, where the children were raped and murdered. And you know, something's come to all the circle of nine. Have you ever heard of that before? God. Well, Kevin found out where the, the bones were buried, and he dug them up. He found out living survivors of this terrible torture routine that was going on. And he called to account the people that were involved and asked for the International Command Commission, the ICC over in Geneva, to indict these people. And they said, we ain't going to touch that with a 10-foot pole because some of the people that you're talking about is the Queen of England, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Pope, the uh, uh, Prime Minister of Canada, and a lot of very, very important people economically and politically. So he, this, this wonderful man, Kevin, was sitting over there the other day. I was one of these love at first sight. When I saw him, I said, I just want to go and hug him, which I did. And uh, now we've got new friendship, and when he comes to Florida, he's going to visit to stay with me. And so that's one of the wonderful things that happened to me on this weekend. But I recommend him you find out more about him and find out the other the names of the people that he's involved. I hate to tell you the names. I can just tell you the positions. He's talking about royalty in Europe, uh, heads of churches, and people of a very prime economic importance in our country that daily, as we speak, are recruiting these children, involuntarily of course, and they're being set up in secret tribunals where they are, from there they're, they disappear into the system. One last thing. I, one of my other heroes is a man named Andy Rooney. You know, I don't listen to the TV, it's a mind sucker, and I don't want to pollute my brains with it, but I do watch once a week. I like to watch 60 Minutes. And part of that is in memory of, of Andy. He, uh, at the end of each session of 60 Minutes, he would talk about things that he's learned. And I have a list of some of these things, I just mentioned them in passing, to show you that as you get older, you can learn things that are important, but they're not uh, something you want to put up on the billboard. <clears throat> For example, Andy says, I've learned that the best classroom in the world is at the feet of an elderly person. I've learned that when you're in love, it shows. That one, just one person saying to me, you've made my day, makes my day. And that having a child fall asleep in your arms is one of the most peaceful feelings in the world. He said, I've learned that being kind is more important than being right. That you should never say no to a gift from a child. That I can always pray for someone when I don't have the strength to help me in any other way. And no matter how serious life is, requires you to be, everyone needs a friend to be goofy with. He says, I learned sometimes all a person needs is a hand to hold and a heart to understand. 
that simple walks with my father around the block on summer nights when I was a child did wonders for me when I was an adult. And that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer it gets to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> he says, I've learned that we should be glad God doesn't give us everything we ask for. Amen. I've learned that money doesn't buy a class, that it's those small daily happenings that make life so spectacular. And that under everyone's hard shell is someone who just wants to be appreciated and loved. He says, I've learned that to ignore the facts doesn't change the facts. That when you plan to get even with someone, you're only letting that person continue to hurt you. I've learned that love, not time, heals all wounds. And that the easiest way for me to grow as a person is to surround myself with people smarter than I am. That's easy for me. I've learned that everyone you meet deserves to be greeted with a smile, that no one is perfect until you fall in love with them, and they are. <laughs> that opportunities is never lost, because someone else will take it if you miss it. That when you harbor bitterness, happiness will dock elsewhere. That I wish it could, I could have told my mom that I love her one more time before she passed away. And that one should keep his words both soft and tender, because tomorrow he may have to eat them. <laughs> and then, finally, I've learned, he says, that a smile is an inexpensive way to improve your looks. <laughs> That when your newly born grandchild holds your little finger in his little fist, you are hooked for life. And that everyone wants to live on top of the mountain, but all the happiness and the growth occurs while you're climbing it. Amen. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. Park Stream Fellow.